Hi, everyone. On today's podcast, we're going to talk with Dr. Monica McLemore and Dr. Jamila Taylor about postpartum justice. Welcome to the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. My name is Rebecca Decker, and I'm a nurse with my PhD and the founder of Evidence-Based Birth. Join me each week as we work together to get evidence-based information into the hands of families and professionals around the world. As a reminder, this information is not medical advice. See evbirth.com slash disclaimer for more details. And now I'd like to introduce our honored guests, Dr. Monica McLemore and Dr. Jamila Taylor, who will be talking with us about postpartum justice and the need for Medicaid coverage of the entire postpartum year. At the University of California, San Francisco, Dr. Monica McLemore is a tenured associate professor in the Family Healthcare Nursing Department, an affiliated scientist with Advancing New Standards in Reproductive Health, and a member of the Bixby Center for Global Reproductive Health. She retired from clinical practice as a public health and staff nurse after a 28-year clinical nursing career in 2019, however, continues to provide flu and COVID-19 vaccines. Dr. McLemore's program of research is focused on understanding reproductive health and justice. To date, she has 81 peer-reviewed articles, op-eds, and commentaries, and her research has been cited in the Huffington Post, Lavender Health, three amicus briefs to the Supreme Court of the United States, and two National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine reports, and a data visualization project entitled How to Fix Maternal Mortality, The First Step is to Stop Blaming Women that was published in the 2019 Future of Medicine edition of Scientific American. Dr. McLemore's work has appeared in publications such as Politico, ProPublica, NPR, and she has made a voice appearance in Terrence Nance's HBO series Random Acts of Flyness. Dr. McLemore is the recipient of numerous awards and currently serves as chair for Sexual and Reproductive Health Section of the American Public Health Association, and she was inducted as a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing in 2019. Dr. Jamila K. Taylor is a Director of Healthcare Reform and Senior Fellow at the Century Foundation, where she leads TCF's work to build on the Affordable Care Act and develop the next generation of health reform to achieve high-quality, affordable, and universal coverage in America. A renowned health policy expert, Dr. Taylor also works on issues related to reproductive rights and justice, focusing on the structural barriers to access to health care, racial and gender disparities in health outcomes, and the intersections between health care and economic justice. Throughout her 20-plus year career, Dr. Taylor has championed the health and rights of women of color and other marginalized communities both in the U.S. and around the world, promoting policies that ensure access to reproductive and maternal health care, including building support for insurance coverage of abortion. Before TCF, Taylor served as Senior Fellow and Director of Women's Health and Rights at the Center for American Progress, where she led their efforts to advance policies that ensure women have an equal opportunity to live healthy and economically secure lives. Prior to CAP, she was a senior policy advisor at IPAS, a global NGO dedicated to ending preventable deaths and disabilities from unsafe abortion. Dr. Taylor has published and presented extensively on topics related to reproductive justice, maternal health, and health policy. Her work has been seen in numerous academic and peer-reviewed journals, as well as in media outlets such as The Hill, U.S. News and World Report, Scientific American, Yale Journal of International Affairs, and a host of other publications. Dr. Taylor has testified before Congress and has provided commentary on top media networks, including NPR, Al Jazeera, BBC, and so many more. And today we are just completely thrilled that the two of you are are joining us here and welcome to the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. Yay! Thank you for having us. Yay! Thank you for having us. It is just our honor to speak with you. Our team at Evidence-Based Birth, the team that works here, you know, was just, we want Dr. McLemore and Dr. McLemore is like, I want Dr. Taylor too. And we were like, yes, that sounds like a dream team. (laughs) So thank you so much for both of you for agreeing to join us and for being here together because we think it's so important that, you know, that there's teams working on these issues because it's not something that any one individual can fix by themselves. So tell us, how did you two meet and start working together? 
Well, Monica and I are have the pleasure of serving on the board of directors of Black Mamas Matter Alliance, which is a, a national organization that focuses on centering Black women in the response to America's maternal health crisis. And even before that, I mean, I had admired Monica from afar and followed her work and research over the years. And it was when we became you know, co-board members that we got to work more closely together. And that launched a whole host of other opportunities, including, you know, the article that we co-wrote for Scientific American that we'll talk about today. Yeah, I was trying to think back, like when we actually really started working together, because I I too have been an admirer from far of Dr. Taylor's work. I knew about your work at IPASS, and I think we, we didn't actually meet, though, until... Uh, you were transitioning from the Center for American Progress to the Century Foundation. I think that's when we actually like like interfaced uh, together. But you know, your work is like <laughs> you know legendary in our field. And I was like, oh wow, that's like a that's a black woman scientist. Oh my god, that's political like policy work. Like, oh my goodness. So I think we've had sort of a mutual respect and admiration for each other's work for way longer than we've actually worked together. But now we're being more intentional, mm-hmm. I think, in terms of the kinds of work that we've been doing. Our Scientific American piece is just, you know, one piece we can talk about. We're actually guest editing, you know, a journal around reproductive health rights and justice in the fall, which is going to be so much fun. But I'm, I'm just a huge, you know, you know, honored and humbled to be able to be on the board of the Black Mamas Matter Alliance and to serve with Dr. Taylor and our other colleagues. So that's the a long story about how we met and how we, you know, started working together. But I think we both function from this perspective that, you know, science is is, you know, it builds on itself. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people historically have interpreted that as like competition or like some weird thing. Like this is where I don't think the translation of science from the life sciences or from bench science is really helpful. Because I don't think it has to be a competition. I think it's more of an alignment and an endorsement and then an amplification. So I love Dr. Taylor's work. So I'm glad I get to work with her. <laughs> so the, and it's interesting that you bring up, you know, research often has these kind of like aggressive, paternalistic, mm-hmm. you know, male dominated, white dominated aspects. So it must mean a lot to you both to be able to find somebody who's not from the dominant culture to work with together towards mutual goals? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about as Monica was talking to is that, you know, it's been so important for, I think, the movement of Black women that are are working in maternal health and reproductive justice to also lift each other up and promote our scholarship as a unit, because we we don't get, you know, the, the shout outs and the proclaim that our white counterparts do. And oftentimes we also have to deal with, you know, our white counterparts co-opting our work and our strategies mm-hmm. in this space. And so I think a big part of our mission and goals and just how we do the work is also to lift each other up and make sure that folks know that we're here, we're doing the work. We're out in front and and essentially we are the leaders of this movement and we should be respected as such. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. And the only thing I would add is that, you know, our ideas, I think when they collectively come together, like this was very clear when we were doing the Scientific American piece, that the curating a, a culture or a space where Black women can think together and think differently about sort of dominant culture narratives is, is like crucial to innovation, right? I mean, that piece would have never been, I think, as fabulous as it is if we did not have, you know, learners and if we weren't able to bring in the actual, actual experts. Like it was, it would have been really ridiculous for me to lead a, you know, an invited piece on postpartum justice and not include Dr. Taylor's work. She had just presented <laughs> on postpartum Medicaid, like, I mean, just finished a whole research project, right? I mean, it, it, I want us to start to think differently. And this is how we also try to embody RJ principles and how not only how we do and design our studies and how we report them and, and who's on the team, but also like knowing when there's expertise that's missing. If you can share the mic or pass the mic, that's what you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And and I want that to be normalized. So, you know, that's that's how I how, how I think about, you know, why it's so important to be able to engage in this way. This March of 2021, 
You published an article in Scientific American that you were mentioning called We Must Extend Postpartum Medicaid Coverage, and it was a team effort. It looks like there were other people, important people on your team as well. Can you tell us a little bit about how that article came to be? Like, What led you to come together as a team to publish that article? The story behind this is hilarious. So ACOG, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, tweeted out something a bit, you know, around how postpartum uh, coverage was being discussed as part of the American Rescue Plan. And I retweeted it. And that resulted in my tweet catching the attention of uh, Lauren Helmuth, who is the editor-in-chief of Scientific American. And she wrote me a d- direct message and said, duh. She was like, do you think you'd be willing to do a piece on this? And I, she says, I'm going to have one of my editors reach out to you and, uh, you know, Michael will work with you to be able to pull this together. But this just seems like a, you know, no brainer. And why don't you do it? So when Michael reached out to me, I said, well, but um, OK. And I have a long history of working with Scientific American to push them to do stuff, you know, differently. Right. So I said, um, well, can I have some more people on here? Like I have trainees who are looking at these issues. There's an expert in the field we have to have in this piece. Otherwise, I'm not doing it. And they were like, oh, like I'm at the point now when I ask for these kind of things, like people are like, oh, OK, yeah, we're we going to figure out how to make that work. So I, I think, did I text you, Jamila, or I emailed you? I, at some point, I was like, she has to lead this. I hope she can do it. <laughs> She's leaving out some key pieces here. So first of all, she is like a Twitter maven. If you don't already yes. follow her listeners, please do, because it is an absolute treat. Um, so she sends the tweet, but it's also getting so much, you know, like attention on Twitter. And so I'm sure that that's part of the the mindset behind, you know, Scientific American reaching out because, I mean, Monica's tweet really helped to elevate the issue and the tweet, you know, from ACOG. So that's a part of it, too. I mean, she has th- this huge following and, and she's such a trusted voice in the field um, that that's also part of it, too. And so as all of that was happening, yes, I get a, a text from her. I'm like, of course, I'm in. Any chance to, you know, write a piece with Monica, I'm in. And I think we, you know, and then we sort of got on an email chain with everyone else and we started writing right away. Like, right away. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We all I mean, this, this stopped what we were doing. Yeah. When, we you, when you, well, when you assemble the right team, like you really like took it to, the, I mean, so Dr. Taylor is being, you know, humble, but she already had the, the the bullet points, the rule book. Like, that's why I was like, it would be so perfect to be able to write with her. So truth be told, you pulled the skeleton of that together and was just like, oh, no, no, this is how we need to do this. We need to do yeah. that. We need to do this. I think a big part of it too, you know, Monica mentioned the American Rescue Plan, which, you know, I think we want to shout out the the Biden-Harris administration and folks on the Hill for setting in motion, you know, having this important provision included in the bill. But I think part of the process as we were writing this too, is that once we got to digest what the provision looked like, you know, it's, it's a step in the right direction, but it's not it wasn't all that we want, right? Like the provision is an optional, you know, provision for states to, to take up postpartum coverage extension. It doesn't have any federal matching funds to support states in terms of funding, because, you know, to be quite honest, this is something that is expensive. We're talking about, you know, adding on um, additional enrollees to the to the Medicaid program. And so um, it is expensive. And in this period where, you know, states are still struggling and grappling with, you know, financial hardship due to COVID-19. And so it was a mixed bag, but I think the piece was so important because it also helped to explain one, why this step is important, but also how it falls short. And then also what we're going to be doing over the long term, which is to continue to push for this to be permanent for all states and for states to have the funding support that they need to do this and to do it right. Yeah. And and the other thing that this piece allowed us to do was, you know, the Black Maternal Caucus in the Congress led by Lauren Underwood and Alma Adams, two of my sheroes, you know, they have reintroduced the omnibus, right? So people forget that there was nine bills in the 116th Congress that got introduced, the mon- I guess it was the Monday or the Tuesday before the nation went on lockdown for COVID-19, that really had some of the provisions that we really like were visionary. Like, like people who've worked in, in reproductive health rights and justice for years have asked for, have advocated for. Then you got the pandemic, then you got the national lockdown and all that mess, right? But the first thing that Lauren Underwood and Alma Adams did in the 117th Congress, of which we are in right now, 
was not only to reintroduce the omnibus, but to also add another three bills that were very specific to COVID. And so in the midst of us writing this op-ed, which we pulled together, what was that, like three days? Like, it, 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 they were like, you got 750 words, and we yeah. need like ASAP, right? Yeah. <laughs> it was so, over the weekend. Yeah, it was yeah, over the weekend. weekend, right? And um, so as we were doing that, we also got to tell the story of the momnibus, right? We got to say, this is a step toward actually what RJ people have really been asking for, you know, for a long time. So then we got word. How did we hear? Maybe maybe you sent me a note. We heard that Biden was going to sign the American Rescue Plan like earlier than when Scientific American was going to run the piece. And so we yeah. actually ended up having to write to the editors to say, hey, y'all, y'all might, because they were going to run it on a Saturday. Yeah. And I think he was set up to have a press conference where he was going to sign the American Rescue Plan on a Tuesday, I think it was, or a Wednesday. So we wrote them. Again, they're a very responsive group of people. That's why it's so good to work with them. We wrote them and said, y'all, look, it, it, I wouldn't wait until Saturday to publish this because we believe, and we've heard from the administration, that they're actually going to sign the American Rescue Plan that has this provision in it today. And they were like, oh, okay. So then they just moved it up on the production <laughs> schedule. We edited it a little bit, right? Because we did have to say sign into you know, law by yeah. President Biden earlier today or something like that. But they were really responsive in terms of helping us to continue to shape that narrative. Mm -hmm. And that's the other th reason why I like working with Dr. Taylor. We have a very synergistic way of thinking about, you know, how to be strategic in, in helping to continue to use data to shape narratives. <clears throat> yeah. And so for our listeners who aren't familiar with this legislation and with the Momnibus. So the Momnibus was originally, one of its provisions was going to be to extend postpartum Medicaid coverage. And since that bill has not yet been passed, um, you right. were able to get the, the postpartum Medicaid extension in this, they were able to get it in this American Rescue Act this spring of 2021. I would defer to Dr. Taylor because she probably knows more. Yeah, I'm, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> So, so let's start with the Momnibus first. You know, Monica gave a great overview of that. And, you know, basically it's it's one of the most comprehensive pieces of legislation to date that focuses on addressing Black maternal health. So at this point, I think it's 12 bills that make up the package. And, you know, it covers everything from maternal vaccinations to addressing the climate impacts um, on pregnancy and birthing to, you know, ensuring access to health insurance coverage. There are provisions in there that focus more on like the quality of coverage if we were to get a postpartum coverage extension, but the bill in itself does not operationalize that. There are other pieces of legislation that actually focus on getting the postpartum coverage extension. So, so want to be clear on that. And the American Rescue Plan is basically, you know, Biden's first flagship piece of legislation that focuses on responding to COVID-19. And so in the context of, of shaping that legislation, um, advocates were really clear about the impacts of COVID-19 on pregnant and birthing people and how important it would be to ensure continuous coverage for, for birthing people in the postpartum. Dr. Taylor, you were explaining uh, the Momnibus bill and we got briefly interrupted. Can one of you talk a little bit about, you know, you talked about how comprehensive it was and what pieces then got put into the Recovery Act in 2021 since the Momnibus has not yet passed? Mm -hmm. So we were talking about the American Rescue Plan and the Momnibus, and there are two different pieces of legislation. The Momnibus is this comprehensive package of 12 bills that really, I think, is probably one of the most comprehensive approaches to addressing the Black maternal health crisis in this country. It covers everything from maternal vaccinations to, you know, the climate impacts um, on pregnancy and birthing to issues like insurance coverage, ensuring access to insurance coverage. The Momnibus does not include the postpartum coverage extension, which we have talked about a lot in today's broadcast, but there are other pieces of legislation that do 
include the postpartum coverage extension. There are different iterations of that. Some bills would make it an option for states, which is similar to what we've seen in the American Rescue Plan. And there are other pieces of legislation like the Mommies Act, for example, that would make it mandatory for states. And so part of the conversation around the American Rescue Plan was really because that bill is focused on addressing um, or recovering from COVID-19, those of us that are advocates in the maternal health space really talked to members of Congress as well as the administration about why it was important to ensure continuous coverage for pregnant and birthing people on the Medicaid program. And so that's how we ended up getting a provision in, into the American Rescue Plan that focuses on the extension. Again, you know, we were very much focused on making this permanent um, in terms of the continuation of coverage. And we did come to a compromise with the optional provision that is also temporary. It would only be for five years um, coming out of the pandemic. Okay. And what does this coverage mean? You know, what's a normal coverage postpartum for somebody on Medicaid and what does the extension mean and who does it cover? So right now under Medicaid policy, for people that enter into the Medicaid program through the pregnancy pathway, they are covered through their, you know, prenatal care, birthing, postnatal care, up to 60 days after giving birth. And so at that point, they're cut off from coverage. And so what we've been advocating for as part of this extension is that for, you know, postpartum people to have coverage through the full year of the postpartum period to ensure that they have the coverage and health care they need in this sensitive postpartum period. And so the fact that we have an option implemented means that states have the option to take it up or not, right? And the option was there even before the American Rescue Plan. You know, there are some states who opted to apply for Section 1115 waivers with the Department of Health and Human Services, which these are really proposals um, for states to, you know, put out an idea or an innovation in terms of Medicaid policy in order to advance um, coverage under the Medicaid program. And so Illinois, which is one of the states that I wrote about in the report, one of the states that issued one of the those waivers, and it was just approved under the Biden-Harris administration. And so there are different avenues for states to be able to take this up. Um, I think for the advocacy community, it's really important for, for us, I think, you know, to advocate for it to be mandatory. We think that all women deserve to, and birthing people deserve to have this coverage for the full one year. And again, this is just the Medicaid population, so it doesn't cover those on private insurance or other insurance sources, which Dr. McLemore also mentioned before the break. Yeah. Dr. McLemore, can you tell us what are the implications for disruption of coverage? So if somebody loses their Medicaid coverage 60 days after giving birth, what, what are the potential harmful effects of that? Well, I mean, I I think it's really important that we contextualize this for your listeners because, you know, it's estimated that 45% of births in the United States are covered by Medicaid. So it's a huge number of individuals. And I always like to remind people that childbirth prior to COVID-19 was the number one reason that people were hospitalized in in the United States, right? I mean, we have 4 million births a year. And so when we think about, you know, what a huge existential experience that is for people like becoming a parent is like a huge deal so it changes your relationship with the adult that's involved in the pregnancy if you have other children it changes your relationship to them with the new person plus the adult that's involved in the pregnancy like it's a huge period of transition but some of the unintended consequences of discontinuing coverage people forget that you know for folks on medicaid you're talking about you know their health insurance you're talking about their dental coverage you're talking about their eye coverage you're talking about all the primary care things that that people don't have access to. And I I think for all of those different transitions, I mean, you're also talking about lactation and human milk and chest feeding. You're talking about if you have a cesarean section, that's major abdominal surgery. Like these are big transitions. And to not give people the time that they need in order to be able to adjust to those transitions and to work on those health issues that are associated with being a postpartum person, I, I think it, we, we end up paying for it down the long run because we're not allowing people to access those preventative and those screening services that are so crucial at a very, very pivotal time point. 
The other statistics that, that the listeners need to really understand is we estimate that between 60 and 70% of maternal deaths are preventable. And that between 40 and 50% of those deaths happen in a postpartum period. So when we think about not just these physical pieces, but then you also have behavioral mental health. As Dr. Taylor talked about earlier, this is a huge transition and to not have coverage to be able to get different care needs met, I quite frankly think is unethical. And I think mm -hmm. we need to start calling it out as such. So when you go through, you're in the middle of this huge transition and all of a sudden your Medicaid insurance drops, which it would theoretically for about half the U.S. population 60 days after giving birth. Like, does that make it more difficult to access clinics and healthcare and um, other services? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Data on that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, based on, on the research that you know the Century Foundation conducted, you know, last year, you know, it, it causes a disruption in healthcare services. So you're losing your coverage, and then you're also losing your your healthcare, the healthcare that you need. And we saw this be particularly problematic for high need moms. These were were women who um, were also grappling with you know mental health challenges, substance use disorders, you know, even something as simple as having access to family planning when you lose your coverage, you, you also lose access to those services. I think also too, for, for those that are high need, they also, you know, work very closely with care coordinators. You know, these are people that help yep. make sure that all of their healthcare providers are talking to each other. They're making sure that mom is getting to her, her various healthcare appointments. They're also helping to make sure that, you know, she's also getting her infant um, to, to, you know, its healthcare appointments. And so, so it really is, you know, just a perfect storm, I think, in terms of, you know, experiencing a whole host of challenges in that period. I mean, one thing I'll also mention, too, is that some of the moms that we talked to also mentioned, you know, just the fact of losing coverage also triggered m mental health challenges for them, not knowing when they could go to the doctor, you know, grappling with, you know, diabetes and, and other health challenges, um, you know, created a, a triggering of health, mental health challenges. And so it really is, I think something is simple for, for us to address and fix. We're talking about just, you know, taking that coverage drop from 60 days to a year. And I think also a, a key point part to, to mention in this too, is to making sure that we're supporting these, you know, birthing people and families with the support that they need in terms of any transitions, even beyond, you know, the, the year of coverage, right? Like ensuring that they have access to some other source of insurance, even after a year of coverage, um, I think is also the responsibility of our healthcare system um, and social services system to support families and, and making sure that they do that. Yep. And really our postpartum care has been pretty abysmal in the United States. On average, you know, there's the one six to eight week checkup for mm -hmm. decades that was, you know, all that was really accepted. And it's really only been recently that ACOG called for more comprehensive care. While it's something that midwives have known for a long time that you need to do a lot of checkups in the weeks and months following birth and the days following birth instead of waiting six to eight weeks. Yeah. Um, in addition to midwifery care, what are some solutions that healthcare workers and birth workers and other people in the community who serve families can do to lower the impact of perinatal mortality and complications and all of those problems that can happen in the first year? Well, I mean, midwives are definitely a solution. I think doulas as well. I think team-based care is really important. I would also add on nurse innovations like centering pregnancy, which is group prenatal care model or nurse home, uh, nurse family partnership, where you have nurse home visiting, partnering with communities to be able to make sure that different needs are getting met. I also think we as a country really need to wrestle with paid family leave because I think paid family leave is like super important. And no, yes, as Dr. McLemore mentioned, all of those things are, are critically important. Um, I, I think another piece of this too, and this just piggybacks off of what Monica is saying, is having this holistic approach to care. And so particularly for marginalized populations and women of color, particularly black women who, you know, are, you know, um, most harmed by, you know, these pregnancy related challenges, um, healthcare challenges, making sure that, you know, health providers are, you know, 
in their approach to healthcare, they're doing it in a way that takes into account their lived experience, you know, not only of, of themselves, but also their families. There may be unique, you know, non-traditional family structures at play, you know, supporting our LGBTQ plus families and their mm-hmm. approach to healthcare. So so really being holistic in the approach to care. And then another thing that we, you know, haven't had the chance to talk through today is also, you know, ensuring that the approach to healthcare is being done in an anti-racist way. Um, right. And and I know that, you know, the United States is still behind in making sure that we we train and support healthcare providers in order to be able to offer healthcare in this way. But this is also a big part of the advocacy and the work that we're doing as a community to make sure that Black women are listened to in the context of you know their experiences with the healthcare system. This is still a major problem in, in how not just pregnancy related care, but all healthcare is delivered, particularly for for Black folks. We've seen it play out in COVID nineteen you know, some of the health equity issues there. And um, it's really a problem in this country. I think folks are starting to talk about it more and like and recognize that it's an issue, but we need to do much more to to address um, racism in the healthcare system because it's, it's causing lives. Um, and we see it play out for decades, some would say centuries, if you sort of look back to the historical foundations of um, medical racism in this country, we continue to see it play out today. Yeah, I agree with that. And and I would also say that at some point, we really want to reimagine how we provide pregnancy-related care in the country. I mean, group prenatal care came out of a frustration of, you know, one person behind a closed door with a patient, and they really wanted to have that relational care, that peer-to-peer learning. In the same way that home visiting really was necessitated and came out of this desire to meet people where they're at. So maybe, you know, we can look to some of the models we have around the country, like the Roots, uh, you know, Community Birth Center in Minneapolis run by midwife Rebecca Polson. That's a, everyone knows that's like a community center. Yeah, it might be a birth center, but it's a whole lot of other things, right? I mean, they have artists, they have musicians, they got DJs, they got like nutritionists that come in and teach people how to cook. Like it's a whole different thing. Or when you think about uh, choices in Memphis, Tennessee, right? I mean, they have co-located birth and abortion services and, and, you know, uh, trans care for trans identified individuals. I mean, they have a whole, but that's also like a community center. It is a place where people gather and people convene. So maybe what we need to think about is put more care back into health care and mm-hmm. redesigning, you know, spaces where we can really lift up what are those essential services that people need in the postpartum period and design the services around like the using a community focus. Right. Because one thing that I, I think has fallen apart or or I, mean, I was glad to see ACOG and, and ACNM and a whole lot of other professional organizations really affirm the fourth trimester. But what I, and, you know, as the postpartum period, what I really wanted to see was a community focus on that. Not just I'm a postpartum individual. No, you're not. You're a family unit. Right. And that you could have grandmamas and aunties and all these other folks. Right. I mean, so it is a bigger thing. And so maybe we need to treat postpartum you know, care, like community care, and really acknowledge that it's not just about a birthing person, you know, the baby that emerges and whatever other adult is involved in the pregnancy, that maybe that's the first place where we could actually combine, you know, health care with community care. I love that suggestion of just reimagining it as a community event and as community care and putting the care back in health care. That's just Perfect. And so powerful. Are there any upcoming projects that either of you are working on that you'd like to share with our audience that we can keep our eye out for or that we can support or follow? Yeah, I think one of the things, there are lots of things that, you know, we're working on, but one of the things that I wanted to share with listeners is that the Century Foundation is planning an event for this fall that will focus on um, gains made in maternal health policy under the Biden-Harris administration and the 117th Congress. And so if folks are interested in learning more and and joining us for the event, they can keep track um, at tcf.org, our website, or Follow us on Twitter at TCFDOTORG. Um, but we'll have more um, information coming up on that hopefully soon. Yeah. And, you know, for me, it, it's this bigger idea. There are a lot of really interesting and cool uh, research projects that are going to be started that's coming down the pike, you know, to really understand the path to midwifery 
what does care in, in a year of postpartum actually look like? I don't think we've actually mapped what should we be doing right? What do community members need? So we are starting to think about doing some listening tours to find out. Okay, so if we are going to extend coverage, right, is it just connection to primary care? No. I think, you know, how do we meet people's spiritual needs? How do we get at their mental health needs? Like, I think this is such an exciting time to think about, okay, if we now have an extended period of coverage for postpartum people, it shouldn't just be, be driven by a health complaint. What else could we be offering people in that time period that will help to bolster like their transition, their family role transition? How can we be thinking about that in a way that I don't think we've had the freedom to do so in the past, right? I mean, yes, you want to do that important connection to primary care and you want to make sure that chronic diseases are being managed and you want to make sure if, if contraception is what people want, they can get it. That's great. But what else could we be doing in terms of health education, health promotion, Building trust. I would love to convene some stakeholders to talk about that, <laughs> right? Because we know what to do, you know, in the six week postpartum visit. We want to do this, 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 and that. But now that we have a chance to vision around what a year of extended coverage could look like, what are we, what are we prepared to offer postpartum mm -hmm. people? Yeah. And I know parents, you know, they're often viewed as an event, like you're a pregnancy and you're a birth and you're a yeah. postpartum visit. But there's so many anxieties that go into that first year of raising a baby and becoming a parent and feeding your baby and, you know, watching for your baby's milestones that there, mm -hmm. we hear from so many parents at evidence-based birth who are very anxious about that role. They don't, they don't know how to do it. We've lost a lot of that community connection yep. and passing down of how you care for infants and how you care for yourself as a new parent. So I love that idea of re-envisioning what we, how we care for families during that first year. Yeah. I also think that on the, from the cultural side and, you know, as you all talked, it made me think about, you know, even my own experience, you know, mm -hmm. after I had my son, I think, you know, for communities of color, it's, it's typical for it to be like a community experience. You got grandma, auntie, mm -hmm. <laughs> neighbors, you know, everyone is sort of gathered around, not just baby, but also making sure mom is like taking care of herself, you know, mm -hmm. offering support. I know for me, like when I gave birth to my son, I had no clue about, you know, what breast, how to breastfeed and like what that entailed. And like my mom and, and older sister were there along the way. And like, you know, helped to guide me through it. And we need to get back to, I think, that approach. And I think yep. there's a lot that, you know, particularly, you know, our white brothers and sisters can learn from our communities when it comes to that approach to just supporting families in the postpartum period. And to be quite frankly, the postpartum period beyond a year, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't around. End. The like, struggles you know, don't end. Yeah, the oh. struggles do not end. You know, my son is is now sixteen, and I, you know, still feel like there are some postpartum um, <laughs> things that I that I grapple with, and so it's really about you know I love the community approach, and I, I don't I think we need to get back to that. Yeah. You know, and it's really a way of sort of like I think teaching or, or helping others to also learn that this is how we do birth, and you know how to support families in that way. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor and Dr. McLemore, for sharing your wisdom and your power with us. What's the best way for people to follow your work? I know, Dr. Taylor, you mentioned at TCFDOTorg on Twitter. Yeah, so that's our organization. And then my personal Twitter account is at Dr. D-R-T-A-Y-L-O-R-09. And then again, also, you know, folks can find some of my work on um, TCF.org, the website. And Dr. McLemore? Yeah, I'm myself everywhere. So I'm McLemore MR and M, you know, McLemore M for Monica, R for Rose, which is my middle name. And on all socials. And, you know, my work is, you know, prolifically available in multiple outlets. And I try to be really intentional around open source so that research is not, you know, behind a firewall. But if you do find that that's the case, you can hit me up and I'll send you a PDF. <laughs> Yeah, I encourage our audience to follow both of you on social media. And like Dr. Taylor said, Dr. McLemore is uh, very educational and entertaining to, to follow be. on Twitter. <laughs> Try to be. So thank you oh, no, both. On a whole host of, of topics, not just maternal health. Exactly. <laughs> Try to be. Thank you both for sharing your time with us. 
Well, thank, thank you for you having us. Yeah. This podcast episode was brought to you by the book, Babies Are Not Pizzas, They're Born Not Delivered. Babies Are Not Pizzas is a memoir that tells the story of how I navigated a broken healthcare system and uncovered how I could still receive evidence-based care. In this book, you'll learn about the history of childbirth and midwifery, the evidence on a variety of birth topics, and how we can prevent preventable trauma in childbirth. Babies Are Not Pizzas is available on Amazon as a Kindle, paperback, hardcover, and audible book. Get your copy today and make sure to email me after you read it to let me know your thoughts.